Welcome to this special podcast series on culture and the creative economy, sponsored by Netflix. I'm Michael Frank with Economist Impact. Often our research here focuses on economic trends that are relatively straightforward to measure, analyze, and forecast. But what if those trends exist primarily in the mind? I'm talking about the creative sector, art, film and television, gastronomy, music. They originate in a creator's mind and are consumed in the audience's mind. But there is a real world component to it all. And in this podcast series, we're exploring the relationship between culture and the creative economy. There are many facets to this relationship, from soft power and diplomacy, to trade, to education and employment. We will speak with several experts on how they see this relationship and what the implications are for government, business, and society. I first spoke with Zaritza Rosevic, who is the executive director of the UN World Tourism Organization, to try to understand some of the foundational elements of the creative economy. So I guess maybe we can just get some definitions out of the way at the beginning. My, my first question is, what is the creative economy? Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're very pleased to share what we, what we do and, and how we can move forward. Um, the creative economy is an ecosystem made of many industries and activities uh, which foster economic growth and uh, generate income. Uh, supporting local businesses and creating jobs, but uh, in the same time, it promotes uh, positive social inclusion and uh, cultural cohesion. So um, over time, uh, creative economy has evolved. Today, we have to factor that in the creative economy, digitalization and the digital world have their own big space. And we have seen an evolution and an uptake of the creative economy as well, thanks to that new space. It's not only gastronomy, it's not only painting, it's not only culture, uh, it's as well the uh, digi digital world, which offers immense opportunities and which I can say, we go from, from the digital skills like following something on your phone to the metaverse where to which everybody is currently uh, tending to. Thank you, and I, I, I like that too, because it, it's, I think a more holistic definition than a lot of people might think of in their first impression. Similarly, what is tourism? Because my understanding is is the way UNWTO looks at this is is pretty interesting. It captures a lot more than maybe most people might think at, at their first impression. Absolutely. Uh, what is very important to understand, and sometimes because tourism is fun and tourism uh, is leisure and pleasure, People do not see it uh, as, a, as a very important economic activity. Tourism is uh, categorized in the world globally uh, as traded services, meaning that it is a tradable good. But contrary to many trade exports that, for example, uh, you produce uh, an item and you ship it to another country, so this is export, Trade is consumed in the country of destination. So visitors are actually bringing their uh, money and purchasing goods and services in a destination. The sector represents the third export earning category after fuels and chemicals altogether in 2019. And with COVID, we went from 1.5 billion international arrivals, that is international tourism, to 400 million in 2020. So the drop has been huge and the impact has been felt, but it has as well done very positive, I can say change to the perception of the sector and the importance of the sector. And of course, tourism is a composite of many sectors and industries, it's lodging, it's restaurants, recreation and creative economies. So the whole ecosystem and value chain, when a tourist come, he generates when he brings $1, he generates $1.5 to up to $3 of economic benefit for the country in which, of course, uh, the creative economy is included. So when it comes to choices, it is very worth to understand that 40% of choices to, of international travelers are made by um, the decision or the attractiveness of culture or creative aspects. So it's culture and nature, basically. The rest is business. But 40% of decision making 
is inspired by the desire to discover other cultures. That's a large share. Um, that's that's interesting. And and if we if we kind of unify these these three concepts here too, where does the creative economy fit in in culture and in tourism? What's cre- the the creative economy's role in those other two categories? As with environment, uh, we we our our I can say our counterparts are government as a as a UN organization, as you know. So, such as UNESCO serves the cult- ministries of culture and the ministries of education, which are other other groups. We do work very closely, of course, and our tourism ministries work very closely with the counterparty at the, at the country level. However, it is not always the case. And therefore, uh, we have seen that in the governance, at the national governance level, when uh, tourism and culture are together under the same foot portfolio, we can see incredible strides and advances in the success of integrating this creative economy and culture within the tourism offer, which is fully sustained actually by culture or nature, depending on the destinations. So it is uh, extremely important to build that dialogue, to increase that dialogue, which sometimes is very obvious when it comes to international organizations, which is not always very obvious. We know that um, each minister in every country has his own space, which doesn't want to be invaded or imposed or regulated by another one. But uh, we have seen in certain countries, like uh, Korea is one, Nigeria is another one, uh, where these or many uh, countries in the Middle East as well have tourism and culture together, uh, that... uh, much more retention of uh, of wealth created by the creative economy and the culture is uh, is uh, uh, one of the one of the success factors of the sector they represent. And maybe zooming out here for for a, a last question, what has been the evolution of that impact uh, of the creative economy as it relates to culture and tourism? How has it changed, and and where is it going? I think that uh, as in every period of life and time, uh, there are fashions. And uh, while we are not going to change the word tourism, we are not going to change the word culture, we have seen that the economic potential and opportunity, uh, we have moved from the world culture to creative economy because it encompasses many, many more different other sectors, including digitalization. I mean, how, how are we going to say today, or maybe in 20 years, Silicon Valley, for example, let's give an example. Silicon Valley is a cultural place, but in 20 years, it's going to be even more a cultural place because it has made an impact on the society and the way we live, and it is part of the creative economy. So that's why I'm saying, uh, creative economy is the branded name of the sector, the economic sector, which represents the translation of the culture in economic terms. I appreciate that that perspective, and I think that this is going to be very, uh, very uh, insightful for our audience. And Zaretsa, just want to say thank you for taking the time and for speaking with us today. I appreciate your insights. It helps to see these principles in the real world. And there may be no better case study on the creative economy than South Korea. As one of the Asian tigers, South Korea grew rapidly in the latter half of the 20th century. But since joining the League of Advanced Economies, it has also become one of the most culturally influential countries in Asia. This evolution known as the Hallyu, or the Korean wave, has seen Korean dramas, films, music, and cuisine become hot commodities across the world. I spoke with Kim Kyungju, who is the director of the Tourism Exhibition Hall Management Team at the Korea Tourism Organization, about the Hallyu and how it is evolving. Kyungju, thank you very much for joining us. I'm excited to speak with you about uh, the the uh, Korean wave or Hallyu, uh, and some of the the ways that your team is is working on incorporating that into your work today. So maybe I can ask you just a first question. How has Korean culture changed in the past two decades? The Hallyu 
the Korean wave has been one of the most representative and symbolic words describing the popularity of Korean culture. In the past, the Korean wave was a limited terminology to a few some Korean dramas and K-pop songs in certain countries such as China and Japan. However, now the, it has been diversified into new areas such as K-food, fashion, films, webtoons, and even video games. Uh, also, the global fans have been expanded beyond Asia to the entire world, including Europe, North and South America. And to what extent is Korea more open and confident in seeing its culture become so globally in influential? Actually, we are seeing unprecedented global success of Korean waves. Just a few examples like BTS, Parasite, and Squid Games successfully have glo attracted global audiences. Therefore, many global fans have been interested in Korean culture. Interestingly, last year, 26 Korean words such as Hallyu, Hanbok, Daebak, and Mokbang were newly added in the Oxford English Dictionary. Therefore, I think that this is a good example of how much global people have interest in Korean culture and Korean society. Absolutely. And language certainly seems to be a reflection of culture. How has the Hallyu influenced Korea's tense bilateral relations, in particular those with Japan and China? We think that Hallyu has been playing an important role easing tensions between nations. For example, despite a disagreement on foreign affairs between nations, touching stories and lyrics in Korean dramas and K-pop songs can be a trigger to help people in different countries realize that we have something in common, regardless of nationality, religion, gender, and age. Therefore, we think that uh, Hallyu has been uh, positively affecting the Korean international relationship. What kinds of opportunities and influence do Korea's creators of today have that uh, maybe their predecessors did not, thanks to the Hallyu? We think that uh, more fans and more markets, which led to more opportunities. Uh, therefore, in the past, the Korean dramas and Korean songs were mainly made for only Koreans. But now, there are a lot of global fans. They provide the Korean local creators opportunities to work with multinational companies like Netflix. And also, with the help of global online services such as YouTube, Korean drama is being released at the same time around the globe. This kind of change was unimaginable in the past. And how has this cultural influence translated into tourism in Korea? The popularity of Korean wave has contributed to enhancing the brand image of Korea nation. Therefore, also, it positively affected various areas, including tourism. For example, according to a 2022 a survey on overseas Hallyu status by Coffee's last year, what kind of Korean products or services global Hallyu fans want to spend their money on, many people were likely to purchase Korean food, followed by travel to Korea. Therefore, we think that uh, the results show the increased influence of Korean content on tourism.
and also its ripple effect is going to in- increase in the future. What is KTO doing to leverage cultural influence to get more people to visit Korea? The Korean dramas had global success around the world with the help of Netflix. Also, global fans have have become strongly interested in Korean culture. Therefore, KTO has established collaborative partnership by making promotional videos and guidebooks showcasing Netflix Korean contents. Also, we newly opened tourism promotional exhibition hall called Hiker, which is located in the center of Seoul. The place combines tourism promotional content with smart technology in order to attract global visitors, especially technology-friendly generations. Therefore, uh, we, you can visit the place, you can experience various Korean content. In particular, Hallyu mm-hmm. Video Content Exhibition Zone called Dramatic Trip is created with a partnership with Netflix. There you can explore the beautiful Korea, such as film locations, Korean food, local drinks, and traditional culture, which were in series. I think many people will take you up on that invitation. It sounds sounds like a great exhibition. My my last question is uh, looking to the future. How does Korea maintain the long-term benefit of ha- of Hallyu? For example, minimizing short-term profit-taking or exploitation, helping to maximize local creators' voices. What does this look like in the long term? We are planning to support local creators, which potentially contribute Hallyu in the future by finding new and young artists. We also are going to hold various exhibitions and contests to provide local creators with the opportunity to meet with overseas global fans by showcasing their works at Hiker Ground. We're off to a flying start looking at the creative economy. So please stick with us as we speak with more experts on this space and explore these trends further in the next few episodes, which you can find on our website uh, at Economist Impact. My thanks to Zaritza Rosevic and Kim Kyungju for joining today. And thank you to you for tuning in. Hope to see you next time.